Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Dealing with the death of Jacob and the death of Joseph, it's the last chapter, Genesis chapter 50. The Bible begins with God and man, the Garden of Eden in perfect fellowship, and ends with Jacob and Joseph going into a coffin. And that shows the kind of uh, progression that has happened in man's life. The book of Genesis is pivotal in understanding what God is doing in his world. He tries to deal with all mankind, but finally he picks one man to pick a nation, to pick a world. And we have been following the development of that of nation and its promise of inheriting the land of Canaan. And we're going to conclude the Genesis account today. So I hope you'll get your Bible and turn me to Genesis chapter 50. Notice it says, Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. Well, obviously, the chapter division is wacko through here. The last few verses, 28 and following, of chapter 49, uh, set the stage of Jacob's death. And chapter 50 flows right into that without any kind of division in the text. And so it's an artificial break here. Joseph had been very close to his daddy, as was Benjamin, his brother. And that relationship must have continued through these years. Notice where it mentions here in verse 2. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Remember, Jacob and Israel are different names for the same person. We studied last week how his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. Now, there are a professional group of people in Egypt known as embalmers. Why would Joseph ask for physicians to do it? Well, probably because of the religious connotations and rites that were involved in Egypt, Egyptian mummification. And so he asked the physicians to perform the procedure instead of the professional priest to perform the procedure. I'd like to read to you an account uh, by a historian named Herodotus of how they embalm these bodies. Uh, let's see. The process of embalming involved the removal of the brain through the nose by a hooked instrument, as well as the removal of the entrails through an incision in the side made with a sharp stone knife. The entrails were placed in a jar. The cranial cavity was filled with spices. Likewise, the abdominal cavity, but as, as well as the entire body, was thoroughly treated with saltpeter for seven days. Afterward, the whole body was washed in palm wine. Then it was daubed with pitch or gums, swathed in many folds of white cloth, and laid away in its mummy case. Wow. Well, they had a long way to go with Jacob's body and had to do that to him, and that was allowed. Notice in verse 3, it took 40 days or required for it, for such is the period required for embalming, and the Egyptians wept for him 70 days. Well, we know that about a couple of hundred years later, during the 18th dynasty of Egypt, when embalming was uh, the norm, it took about 30 days to do it. So here it took a little longer. Uh, the weeping for him for 70 days among the Egyptians means this was a royal funeral. The only uh, difference between this funeral and a funeral for a pharaoh is 72 days in comparison with 70 days. So they really... Uh, had some kind of funeral for Jacob, I want to tell you, in Egypt. Now, listen to verse 4. And when the days of mourning for him were passed, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your sight, please speak to Pharaoh, saying. Well, why would Joseph not speak to Pharaoh in person? He was the second in all of Egypt. Well, it may have been something about his unshaved, unwashed condition for his mourning his father. Or there may have been some purification rite among the Egyptians that Joseph had violated because he had been in contact with the dead in mourning. We just don't know. It may have been a way of trying to get away from the uh, concept of him trying to flee from Egypt. So he just asked somebody in Pharaoh's house to ask Pharaoh. Anyway, we don't know why, but that's how it happened. Verse 5. My father made me swear, saying, Behold, I'm about to die. In my grave, which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan, there you are to bury me. Now, therefore, please let me go and bury my father, then I will return. The promise to return is as emphatic as anything else. He says, I swore to my father. It's an oath that he has to fulfill. Now, if you remember, Jacob bought some land in the, in the land of Israel to bury himself, the cave at Machpelah. And the word I dug here, the same root can mean bought. Um, 
the midrash explanation of this is the cave he bought. Some say no, the word actually means dug or dig, and possibly inside the cave itself, certain family members were placed in certain little cubby holes along the wall so it would hold many of the family. We just don't know exactly. But notice they're going back to Canaan where the promise of God lay and not in Egypt. Pharaoh said, go bury, go up and bury your father as he made you swear. Okay? So Joseph went up to bury his father and with him went all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household and all the elders of the land of Egypt. Man, there was a big entourage here of Egyptians as well as Hebrews. It was a large group of people. Um, boy, I don't know how many hundreds, but a large group. And all the household of Joseph and his brothers and his father's household, they only left the little ones and the flocks and herds in the land of Goshen. Now, obviously, this probably was a way to assure the Egyptians they were coming back and they didn't want to take the children on a long, difficult drive like this. I would have never even thought of taking along the cattle and the herds, but uh, they're mentioned here as not being taken. Now, and also there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, a very great company. Seems like some of the army went along. Probably this many Egyptians with such a high official as Joseph would have caused a, a little suspicion in the land of Canaan and all those other countries where they're going to go. So they took some soldiers just in case there was trouble. Verse 10. Then they came to the th threshing floor at a tad. Now that word means brambles or thorns. The rabbis say it means this threshing floor had a thorny hedge around it. But we're not sure. The place is unknown, uncertain. Uh, Jerome says it was close to Jericho on the western side of the Jordan. Now, when it says, which is beyond the Jordan, this is usually translated to be uh, beyond, meaning on the eastern side of the Jordan they're referring to. But the word we found can mean in the region of, and it seems that's a better explanation, the region of the Jordan. Um, they, they lamented there with a very great and sorrowful lamentation, and he observed seven days mourning for his father. He'd already observed 70 in the land of Egypt. Now he's observing seven more. Why, we don't know. Uh, seven's number of perfection, and maybe there's something to do with that in the Bible, but we really don't know. Now, these were not, this was not your quiet, normal funeral. This was a wailing, a loud lamenting. The, the Orientals show their emotion very openly. It was a very wild time. I think that says to us that uh, we can be believers in God and trust in the afterlife and believe in a future, still have great grief over the loss of our loved ones. Uh, Oriental custom was much more open. Our particular custom was much more subdued. But I think how a person handles grief says nothing about their spirituality or maturity or anything like that. We tend to say you shouldn't cry if you're a Christian. That's just not true. You can cry if you want to. I think tears are very good. You know, crying for three years is probably a problem, but uh, tears at the death of loved ones is very normal, even for the children of God. Now, verse 11. Now, when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the morning. Now, obviously, if the Canaanites are the ones that saw the morning, we're on the western side of the Jordan, not on the eastern side of the Jordan where the Amorites are. Uh, so, I think we're in the area of Jericho, though the site cannot be found for certain. Now, notice where it mentions, and they named the place, and you see it in your Bible there, Abel Merzim, or Mezarim. Uh, the last word is the word for Egypt. And the first word, we've got a play on words going here. Let me spell for you the word for meadow. In, in Hebrew, it would be A-B-H-E-L. Now, the word for mourning or grief in Hebrew would be E-B-H-E-L, one letter difference. And, of course, the ancient Masoretic text had no vowels at all, so it's exact same consonants as meadow or mourning. Now, if they named the place something, it would be unusual to name a place mourning of the Egyptians, although it's possible. Meadow of the Egyptians with a play on words between mourning and meadow seems to be what we're talking about, Okay. Um, verse 12, and his sons did for him as he had charged them, for his sons carried him to the land of Canaan. Now, the rabbis, especially Rashi, makes a real uh, emphatic point here that the children of Jacob carried the, the uh, coffin for him 
in the exact same order as they marched during the Exodus. Certain tribes on one side, certain tribes on the other. If you remember the book of Numbers and Exodus, they, they camped in certain ways around the Ark of the Covenant. The standards were in the same place. And they refer to this as the setting the stage for that. Well, there seems to be not enough in the text to uh, bring that out, though it, it's just an example of rabbinical interpretation. Now, notice where it mentions him, the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre. Now, Mamre, of course, is a very important place where Abraham met God, and it became a very important place for the patriarchal burying center. But here is a group of people who had been promised by God the entire promised land, and yet all they really possessed was one field, one cave, that they brought from a Hittite. And so Jacob is buried there. Now, verse 14. And after he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brothers, and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. This is specifically put in because later on they're going to leave and not come back. And here, the whole entourage returned together. Verse 15, we continue the story about Joseph and his brothers. You see, this whole deal about Joseph burying his father had been a prophecy that was predicted back in chapter 46, verse 4. And so what we have here is a recorded fulfillment of that promise that God made to Jacob about that Joseph would be with him when he died. Now, apparently the other brothers may not have been there because in verse 15 it says, when the other brothers learned. Now, maybe they weren't in the same room. I, I just don't know. But when they learned their father had dead, they began to get nervous. Remember back what they did to their brother and it began to bother them. Listen to verse uh, 15. When Joseph's brothers saw their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph should bear a grudge against us and pay us back in full for all the wrong we have done him? So they sent a message to Joseph, saying, Your father charged before he died, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgressions of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgressions of thy servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Well, obviously he wept. They had again misunderstood him. They had impugned his motives. He had thought this thing was settled, but he realized all these years it had been an open sore in the heart of his brothers. You know, sin leaves scars in the lives of people. His brothers had not got over what they had done to him, and they were still afraid of him, though they had been together some 17 years now. He was still um, someone to be feared and was not fully accepted as a brother. And it broke Joseph's heart when he realized that. Um, they're trying to get him to do something good to them because of a promise that he had made their daddy instead of because they were brothers and he loved them. So he tries to reassure them. In verse 18 he says, And his brothers also came and fell down before him and says, Behold, we are your servants. Now they, they sent a message to Joseph through somebody. And right after the messenger gave the message, then they all came in and said, We want to be your slaves. Remember back when they first came to Egypt and Joseph had played a little trick on them about the cup and all of this and uh, had scared them some about not giving Benjamin back to them? They offered to be his slaves then. Joseph didn't want them as slaves. He wanted them as brothers. And so he's, he tries to, the Hebrew word, speak to their heart here or reassure them. Notice what it says. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. For I am, for am I in God's place? Look at the question mark in your Bible. What's he, he's saying, God's forgiven you. Can I not forgive you? Now, he's not saying, boy, God's going to wait and then sock it to you. I think we misunderstand the New Testament so badly when we think vengeance belongs to God and he's really going to smash those folks who deserve it. The beauty of that is that God is going to take care of that. We don't have to worry about it. Joseph trusted God that his forgiveness was sufficient for Joseph. Joseph didn't hold a grudge. Now, wasn't it didn't hurt him? Remember the story how his brothers had sold him into slavery as a teenage boy and then told his father he was killed? Can you imagine as a teenage boy having your own brothers do that to you? And then all the problems that Joseph had with Potiphar and his wife and put in prison so long. The boy had a lot of le legitimate grounds for bitterness, but he did not let it stay in his heart. Bitterness is worse than cancer. It'll eat your life up. It'll make you an empty, hollow shell of a person. Sin is still leaving its scars in the life of the brothers. But Joseph has rid himself of the bitterness, and he's not carrying the scars from that. Now, notice what it mentions here, verse 20. 
As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. I bet if you'd asked Joseph, he was in prison, if God had forsaken him, there were some days he probably would have said, you know, I don't know anymore. I've been here a long time. A lot of years I've been in this dungeon. But now Joseph looks back on his life. And lo and behold, as we look back in time, we can see the golden footprints of God in the circumstances that have been so hurtful to us. I tell the people at my church that they can't make judgments too readily about circumstances. For sometimes the things we think are such a blessing from God, it turns out we couldn't handle them very well, and what looked to be great turned out to be disaster. And many times what we think was a tragedy, we just couldn't understand how God could let it happen to our lives. As we look back, it was one of the spiritual turning points for us. It's one of those times that gave us backbone and helped develop our character and forced us to trust God. It's become a blessing to us. Joseph is looking back at his life and seeing God in one of the most hurtful periods that he ever had. You know, this is something that occurs all through the Bible. I remember the New Testament when the early church was persecuted. You wonder, why would God allow persecution to scatter the early church? It was a new church, a growing church. Many of the priests were coming to accept Christ. Why would God allow persecution to hit that church? If you look at the book of Acts, it says, "...and they went everywhere preaching the word except the apostles." Persecution did nothing more than spread the flame of the message of Christ. It looked bad, but in reality it was good. There are many examples in the Bible of this. You might think, why was Paul allowed to have a thorn in the flesh? He could have done so much more work for God if he hadn't have had this physical problem that seemed to hold him back and limit him. But God said that physical problem was for Paul's good, that he wouldn't trust in himself and be proud of himself. And so here we have a thorn in the flesh, which in the Bible is called a messenger of Satan that is in the will of God. Now, I'm sure that... Uh, uh, Paul didn't always understand it that way. I personally believe it was oriental ophthalm or eye trouble, but uh, it worked out where God wanted it. The persecutions of Rome look so difficult, but I want to tell you the church grew through persecutions, and she never has grown in times of success. Uh, I think the heresies of the early church helped the early Christians form their theology and put it down. All these things seem bad, but in reality, they turn out for good. Reminds me of Romans 8. 28 and 29. I hope you'll look at your life and think about what I'm saying. Don't judge things in the spur of the moment. Don't think that just because something looks difficult, it's automatically bad and God's forgotten you and forsaken you. I want to tell you, friend, God can use the most horrible thing in your life and use it for good. Now, I'm not saying he sent it. and I'm not saying God uh, caused the brothers to do this. But it was in the plan of God. It was something he used. It was something meaningful in the end though it hurt very, very badly a young teenage boy. Don't judge life in the short run. Judge it in the long run. I, think the, I hope that when I come to the end of my life, I can look back over my life and have a sense of peace about it. Though right now, sometimes, I don't have that peace. Joseph, coming to the end, looking back, could see God every step of the way. It's sometimes hard to recognize Him in the present. But if you take a look back, you'll find He's been there. And he's been with you, and you've never been alone. God often does not change the valley of deep darkness into the plain and meadows of light. But the promise of the book with, he'll walk through the valleys with you. You're never alone. There is a purpose in this. I'd like to give you a book that has meant so much to me. The name of a book, excuse me. Uh, I give away a whole lot of them here in Lubbock, Texas. It's a book that I think really helps me cope with the tragedies and misunderstandings and circumstances of life that I can't understand. It's a book by a Quaker lady written back in the 1800s. Her name is Hannah Smith. It's called The Christian Secret of a Happy Life. Its basic thesis is that nothing just happens to God's children. That book, along with these biblical passages, has given great strength to my life amidst difficulty. I hope you'll buy that for yourself or for someone you know who's going through a time of testing or trials or tragedy. Notice it mentions them. Uh, so therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So be comforted. So he comforted them and spoke kindly, spoke to their heart. 
they were afraid that he was going to cut them off and hurt them. You know, really, if Joseph would have cut them off, they'd have probably gone back to Canaan and, and the whole exodus wouldn't have occurred. It was God's will to keep them in Egypt that God could, could mold them into a nation where there's sometimes it's just scattered tribes. Uh, it, looks, it looks hard when we look back on the, the, the cruelty of the Egyptians later on, but it was in the purpose of God because the exodus is going to occur and the Jewish nation looks back year after year to the exodus as one of the great acts of the covenant God in grace on their, on their people. Now, notice in verse 22 and following. Now, Joseph stayed in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Now, we have learned from Egyptian documents, and uh, the desert of Egypt has been one of the best places to preserve these papyrus documents or cuneiform tablets, and we have many of them, that 110 is the ideal age in Egyptian literature. That's exactly how long Joseph lived. There is something like 28 references in the known Egyptian documents that mention the age of 110. Have you noticed through Genesis how the age is decreasing slowly but surely? Verse 23. Now Joseph saw the third generation of Ephraim's sons and the sons of Maker, the son of Manasseh. Now Joseph had two boys, Ephraim and Manasseh. They took his place in the tribal allocations that were to follow when they came into the promised land. They're often the Bible called the half-tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh. Um, one of them is on the western side of the Jordan, Ephraim. Manasseh has a little plot of land on the west and a large plot on the east. So those are Joseph's sons. They took the place of Levi, okay? As far as inheriting, you get 12. Now, notice the, the word, the son here, maker, uh, is mentioned in Joshua 17, 1. Judges 5, 14 is a very uh, aggressive tribe in this particular tribal allocation. Notice where it says, we're born on Joseph's knees. Now, if you take that literally, that is yucko. Ugh. It's not talking about where the literal birth occurred. It is a Hebrew idiom that seems to express something of the cultural... Uh, idea of adoption. It's analogous to passing under the thigh. Uh, you might want to see chapter 30, verse 3 for a similar kind of thing. It's saying that Joseph accepted these children into his family. And that's the idea here. It's official reception into his family. And then notice verse 24. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised to an oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The book of Genesis closes with a great man of faith, Joseph, about to die, but says, I want you to remember, God won't forget you down here. There's going to come times of testing, times of trial, but God's going to visit you. He won't leave you here. Now, that goes back to the promise made in Genesis 15:16 to Abraham. He said, your people are going to be taken into captivity. They're going to be uh, hurt and, and, and persecuted, but I'm going to remember them. I'm going to bring them out. It was God's will to set the stage for the exodus. Joseph says, hang in there. Don't give up. It will be all right. You may think God's forgotten you, but he really hadn't. That's a good word for our lives. We always can't explain what happens to us. We don't always know the how or the why or the when or the where. But I want to tell you, friend, if you know God through Christ, He is in control of things. And He will work it out for His glory and your betterment if you just trust Him. Joseph says, hang in there, guys. Don't give up. God's going to come get you in His time. He won't leave you there. Now, when it says an oath to Abraham, that, of course, goes back to Genesis chapter 12, repeated in 15, repeated on to the fathers. When it says Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this is the sense of the patriarchal God. God was not ashamed to be known as their God. And these are the patriarchs. Now, it says, And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, visit you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. And notice in verse 26, Joseph is also embalmed. Now, this is fulfilled later on. The Exodus, they bring the bones out, and in Joshua, they bury him in the Promised Land. Joseph wanted to be buried with Jacob in the Promised Land. And the Israelites fulfill that wish. When they come out in the Exodus, they bring the bones with them. I don't think we can... This is the only place in the Bible that talks about people being embalmed. 
I don't think it's fair to read and hear all the Egyptian religious practices and all the ritual and all the myth that goes along. It just is mentioned the fact that Jacob and Joseph, jo Jacob had a long way to go for his burial, and Joseph had many, many, many years to wait. And so embalming occurred to them. To me, it just shows the historicity of the account that we're using Egyptian customs in a time when Israel is in Egypt. And I, I think that's true. Now, in just closing, I want to mention a commentary to you. This is Genesis, a devotional comedy by Griffin Thomas. This is one of those books that spiritualize and allegorize the Bible, which upsets me so badly. I'm a historical grammatical exegete, not an allegorist. They mention that Joseph is the type of Christ. They say Joseph and his brethren, Joseph's rejection, Joseph's humiliation, Joseph's exaltation, Joseph's marriage, Joseph's office. And they use all of these as types of Jesus Christ. Be careful of not reading too much into the Old Testament. This man's a good man, a, a, a great saint, but he is misinterpreted so badly. He is reading his ideas into the Bible. We're so guilty of that if we don't watch it. Make sure you can back up what you say from the Bible itself. Let the Bible speak to you, not you speak to the Bible. Find some place in the grammar or the parallel passages or the context or the, uh, the customs of the day or a New Testament reference to back up what you think the Old Testament teaches. Don't spiritualize the Old Testament. That says more of your intellect than it does of the Bible. God bless you. I've enjoyed being with you. See you again, same time, same place, next week.